So I hope all of you had a wonderful Easter yesterday. Um, I know I did. This was the first time at our um, Easter service at the, the new church we, that we have been going to, and I was pretty impressed. So I thought they struck a nice balance between talking about Jesus and the resurrection to a broader audience, because you know you get the bigger audience on Easter, but it was also challenging to those who believe. So the worship song was worship was great, and we sang one of my favorite songs in um, Graves into Gardens, and I thought it was a fitting song to sing on Easter, since that is a day that we celebrate the resurrection. So one lyric from the song that just kind of stuck with me as I was working on my, finishing up my lecture yesterday and just thinking about it, um, yeah, was was the lyric in that song that says, "Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley." So yesterday on Easter, we celebrated the mountain, the resurrection, the new kingdom. But for the next two weeks, it's kind of like a sidestep. We're going back into the valley. These two weeks are difficult to talk about. They're hard. They're painful. And they are very, yeah, you're very much in the valley, but it is the same God. So we see Jesus unjustly arrested and unjustly put on trial. He's betrayed by his own closest followers, and he's beaten um, severely. So this section of Matthew, it's enraging. It's disturbing. I found it extra so, um, having spent so much time with Jesus this year, spent so much time just seeing what a perfect man he is, and not that anybody deserves what Jesus is going through, but he really didn't deserve what he went through. And yet we know that God is still at work, still with Jesus, even in the deepest valley, and that we need to go through the valley in the, over the next two weeks to understand and appreciate the mountain. So our first section tonight is... 26 verses 47 to 56. So it is Jesus being betrayed by Judas and arrested. I'm going to read the first three verses of the chapter to get us, or not the chapter, but the section to get us started. So while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Judas, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. So here we have it. This is the moment of Jesus' betrayal. There are a couple of things of note I want to point out. First, it's interesting they came at night with a large crowd. We're told in other Gospels this is a mix of Roman and um, Jewish soldiers. So Jesus will point this out later in this text, um, but he's a very public person. There's been no secret where he's been. He's been in the temple. They could have arrested him lots of times. But there would have been a lot of people to witness this and potentially, you know, cry out or fight on Jesus's behalf. They don't want to make a scene. Something that needs to be done under the cover of night uh, with no witnesses present is almost always something that doesn't need to be done at all. Must have been difficult to see. Um, and maybe some of these Roman soldiers don't really know who Jesus is because um, they need Judas to kiss him to properly identify him in this in this moment. So I think it's also interesting that Judas calls Jesus rabbi, not Lord. It's really illustrative of who he understands Jesus to be. The people we've seen called Jesus rabbi in Matthew are the ones who don't understand who Jesus truly is. It's all the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who refer to him as rabbi. The people who believe in Jesus, who really understand who he is, they'll call him Messiah. They call him son of David, Lord, any of these titles. Judas is one of the 12, one of the men who's been closest to Jesus. He's heard all of these intimate teachings. He's even heard comp Peter confess who Jesus is. And yet he himself still doesn't know who Jesus is. This should serve as a good reminder to us that not everyone who you would think is a believer is actually a believer. You know, perfect attendance on Sunday doesn't necessarily mean you understand who Jesus is and what he did. And also that each person needs to know who Jesus is for themselves. Just because you're part of this tight, intimate group, you don't understand who Jesus is just through what the group understanding is, is a decision you must reach on your own. So the men arrest Jesus, which causes one of uh, Jesus' companions, we know this from the Gospel of John to be Peter, to step up and cut off one of the ears of the guard. So this is an interesting detail to include. Um, also the fact that P Matthew doesn't mention this in his Gospel, who did it, is another interesting detail. It seems likely that Peter um, isn't swinging for somebody's ear. You don't do that. You go for the head and you take the ear off. As a consequence, he's trying to kill somebody here. So he's willing to kill for Jesus in this moment, which is interesting where we will see him in the second section. Anyways, the fact that Matthew doesn't name Peter, but John does name Peter helps with some of the dating of the Gospels. If that's kind of your thing. Um, Peter may very well have still been alive when Matthew wrote his Gospel. And you don't want it really out in the public that 
one of this man tried to kill a Roman soldier. Um, so, but John was the, we know that John was the most likely the last of the four gospels written. The fact that John feels more comfortable sharing Peter's name at this point probably means that Peter has died. And that kind of lines up with where the scholars think each one was written. So anyways, Jesus tells his companion, Peter, to put the sword away, telling everyone in verse 53, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? So a Roman legion, if you're curious, was 6,000 men. So Jesus is saying that if he wanted to, he could get more than 70,000 angels at his disposal, which is a which is a bold statement to make if you're anybody but Jesus. Um, it tells us that he is submitting to his father's will willingly right now. He is giving himself up. Even with these armed men coming late at night, doing, you know, trying to trick, trying to make this, you know, the best case scenario for them, they have no chance against Jesus if he actually chooses to resist. He can stop this. He, it is completely under his power. But Jesus knew this was coming, and he knew it was his Father's will. He's been praying and discerning that all night. And he knows that the scriptures attest that this is going to happen. So he willingly gives up his power and lays down his life. Just because you have the power to do something doesn't mean you should do it. Doesn't mean it should be done. You need to pray to discern our Father's will before acting, just like Jesus did. I've mentioned this before, um, but Jesus gives us another lesson in these verses. And in verse 56, when he says, but this has all taken place that the writing for the prophets must be fulfilled. Jesus read what we now call the Old Testament. Those were his scriptures. He saw in that story how what happened to him must happen. He got that from the Old Testament. So when we read the Old Testament, like we will in our study next year, we need to understand the Old Testament in the process of how Jesus did. That they are all point that Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross. And we do that because that's how Jesus read the scriptures, that he, that's what he got out of the scriptures. And that's what I want to get out of the scriptures to read like Jesus. So we end the section with the disciples deserting and fleeing Jesus. All the men who had seen all his miracles, who had walked with him for so long, who had heard him predict that this very thing would happen multiple times. They lose their nerve and they fail their test of faith. This makes me mourn for Jesus. He is now alone, very alone, which only has to heighten his feelings, just the awful feelings that he's going through. It also makes me see just how fallen all of humanity is. I cannot say I would be any better than the disciples in this moment. I'm sure I would I would flee. So God is so faithful. He is so loyal to us that he sent his son to die, and his son willingly takes on that burden. But far too often we scatter when we face true adversity. In fact, I would say we, we need Jesus' power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in those moments to, to strengthen us. So my principle for this first section is Jesus willingly submitted himself to God's sovereign plan. Jesus knows this is coming. He makes that clear in his response to Judas. He's made it clear in previous parts of Matthew. He knows this is his time. He had armies of angels at his command that he could have just had come and save him among myriad other options that he could have taken. And he chose to submit to God's sovereign plan, even though he doesn't want to, um, or he really would have, wouldn't have minded if God would have given him another way. And he makes that clear. It was going to be incredibly painful and awful, and he knew it. But truly, what an incredible and wonderful Savior we have in Jesus. My section section tonight is the end of Matthew 26. Maybe I'm going the wrong direction. 26, 57 through 27, 10. So Jesus is now tried before the Jewish leaders and denied by Peter. But this all kind of feels like a sham to you. And good job. You were able to just notice what a farce, what an injustice this all is. So Dr. Hannah helpfully lists all the issues that we know about that are taking place during this mock trial that he gets. Um, saying, the trial of Jesus before the uh, Sanhedrin is filled with illegalities. It's violations of Jewish law. People who are supposed to most uphold Jewish law are the ones who are ignoring it now when they need to get to what they want. Capital trials were to be held during the day. 
not at night. This was held immediately at night. Verdicts were to be re rendered the following day, not immediately. Trials could not be held on the eve of a feast day, which this is. Witnesses were interrogated according to the law, not just grabbed haphazardly. Blasphemy could only be charged for taking God's name vainly, which Jesus never did. Also, he has no defense attorney present for him. However, if Jesus was arrested Thursday evening and the Sabbath began on Friday evening, things had to be done quickly. Also, Pilate only heard cases very early in the morning. Just kind of just did something in his morning before going on with the rest of his day. So that's why they had to just ram this process through. So the teachers of the law who claim to be so obsessed with upholding God's law, they're willing to discard it when someone threatens their power. I see this kind of behavior too often um, in any big organizations, um, but that would include churches and religious organizations. They res receive scrutiny and pushback for legitimate failures. The ends do not justify the means. And in this case, both the ends and the means are wrong. So the Sanhedrin, if you're curious, it consists of 70 men plus Caiaphas, the head priest. But it's pretty likely not everybody was there. We, In other Gospels, you see people, members of Sanhedrin, who are sympathetic, who are trying to learn from Jesus. Um, you only needed 23 of the 70 members of the Sanhedrin to have a big enough quorum to make a decision. So all they need is the most sympathetic people who want to put Jesus to death to show up late at night, ram it all through before anybody like, say, like Nicodemus, who was more open to listening to Jesus, could have been there and intervened. So we don't know that for sure, but that, that kind of fits in with the vibe that's going on here. So they go out and they search for false witnesses. Under Mosaic law, the bare, the bare minimum for a charge was two credible conforming witnesses. So you, they're looking for all these false witnesses we read about, but none of their stories line up because they're false witnesses. So if you squint your eyes, you can sort of see how Sanhedrin gets that but it quickly falls apart under an honest examination. First of all, a, yeah, so the bunch of false witnesses, they came forward, that should be like, oh, maybe this isn't on the level. Also, if a bunch of um, further examination, if they'd been really interested in finding out the truth, they could have heard from these two false witnesses. There were a bunch of other people who could have attested on Jesus' behalf um, and said that um, Jesus didn't say what the men said he did. So in verse 61, tells us the two men, it says, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. But it's not what Jesus says. It's more of like a prediction, not that he's going to destroy it, that if you destroy the temple, I can rebuild it in three days, not that he is going to do it. So any number of other witnesses could have attested to that and would have overwhelmed these two false witnesses. But that's, again, that's not the point of what we're doing here. The high priest, they want to get Jesus to answer this charge against him once they get their witnesses in order to like, you know, give it a veneer of credibility. But Jesus does not play along. He has no interest in participating in any of this, uh, just this mockery. So we then get this interesting exchange starting in verse 63. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus answers the high priest's question this time and does confess that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. He does affirm that. But he does so very cryptically. His answer kind of reminded me of all of his strategies when he starts telling in parables. Jesus telling and talking in parables is how he deals with dishonest brokers. And this to me seems to be like, I mean, he's in the most situation with the most dishonest brokers he's probably been in. And he seems to answer the same way. The truth that he reveals here is that he is not the political Messiah so long to wish for. So he references Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. We've looked at those over the course this year. And everyone understood these are um, scriptures talking about the Messiah. Um, all, his whole audience would have understood that. So, and, he, he, so and he's kind of claiming that God is going to vindicate him, that he's going to be standing in authority at the right hand of God in the clouds someday. This disclosure is a revelation of the truth. It is also kind of a threat that you are not going to 
Jesus tells them, you are not going to see me again until you face me as judge sitting at the right hand of God. This is too much for Caiaphas, who tears his clothes in indignation. I'm kind of glad we do not do that when we're indignant anymore. A lot of tearing clothes in the Bible. And accuses Jesus of blasphemy. Again, technically this is not true. Jesus does not use the Lord's name in vain. That was the standard. But the other hand-picked members of the Sanhedrin are inclined to agree with the high priest, no matter what. So they pronounce him worthy of death, and they begin to beat and mock Jesus. But the, so how the structure is set up with the government is you've got, you know, the temple. Um, you've got, it's kind of like a political religious. They're pretty blended. But Rome is technically over, um, you know, the temple and the people of Israel. They're part of the empire. And so they did not have the authority to carry out executions. So that is why they need to go to Pilate. Now that they're all, they've got their house in order and what's going to be done. Now they need Rome's power and authority to actually do it. So that's why we get a second sham trial, which we will talk about later. But in the meantime, we get to see the continual failure of Jesus's disciples. First Peter and then Judas. Peter's come to watch and to see what happens. And he doesn't like what he sees. He's asked three times whether he knew or was with Jesus of Nazareth. The first two times by serving women, the final time by other people in the area. It's interesting to see how Peter's denials increase each time. Um, first, we see, can see the literal distance Jesus or Peter travels. He's in the courtyard, and he's in the gateway, and then he leaves the area entirely. He is tr- trying to put as much physical distance as he can get right now between him and Jesus, the man he wanted to kill for a few hours ago. Second, his verbal denials increase. First, he's kind of evasive, then he offers an oath, and then finally he curses, which he's either cursing the people questioning him, or he's cursing Jesus um, to try to show how much he's not a part of this. So after this final failure, he this denial of Jesus, he hears the rooster crow, and finally he remembers what Jesus told him, that this was going to happen, which leads him to bitter weeping and mourning. So it's remarkable that the story is in all four of our Gospels, because the source of the story likely has to be Peter himself. Um, It doesn't seem like any other disciples follow him. He's the only one we're told about following what happened to Jesus. Peter was an important apostle. He's an early church leader. And if he wanted to, he wouldn't have had to report this story to anybody. And yet now all Christians know, and most people know of his uh, failure in his biggest moment. And that Jesus told him it was going to happen and that he would fail. Yeah, Peter has his high moments of, of, and moments of faith. We've seen that. Um, But he is, even he is not worthy of Jesus. We are fallen people. So we are saved by grace, not by works, because all of us have moments like Peter in our story. So this story, along with the rest of the New Testament, I just kind of want to lump that in here. It does reveal God's power and his ability to restore broken people. Peter will still be the rock that Jesus builds his church on, even though this moment of failure is part of his story. God will not cast us out if we truly believe, even if we have spectacular moments of failure and unbelief. God does not cast out Peter for this. Instead, he restores and redeems him and his story. You know, he ends up making Peter an integral part, part of bringing in the Gentiles along with Paul. And this is something he can do for all of us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we do it, it's necessary for us to mourn that failure and process what happened, which we see Peter do here. But that is not the end of our story. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley. and He will be with us in both. Judas also seems to be witnessing the scene either at night or in the morning. And he becomes filled with remorse, finally realizing how awful a betrayal he has been party to. He attempts to atone for his sin by returning the silver he got, telling the chief priests and the elders in verse 4, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Of course, their reply is kind of shocking. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So just the callousness of the chief priests and the elders is stark. On some level, it's actually their responsibility to deal for um, the sinner. You know, they're there to help God's people get right with God, to atone. And that's what they're, that's what they do, but that's, they have no interest in doing it here. They could have helped Judas do a sin offering or recognize their own failure. They had other options available to them. 
But that would all involve acknowledging their own complicity in what happens. These verses reveal why we need a savior, some, a perfect substitute for us on the cross. If we are left to our own devices to atone for our sin, we simply cannot. Judas can't stop what is happening. He can just meekly offer the silver back, but it's done. The sin has happened. The consequences are playing out. We can't atone for it. We need someone to intermediate for us, to, to atone for us. We need Jesus. I'm grateful that, I'm so grateful that Jesus sees my sin as his responsibility, that he humbly submitted himself to the Father's will to help me so I wouldn't be in the situation like Judas is. Because without something and someone else to help us be made whole, be made right, we are hopeless. We are dead. Judas seems to reach that conclusion, and he ends his own life, making his story a just complete tragedy. We then get this interesting aside when the chief priests realize they can't put the money in the treasury. This is blood money. They don't want it to go to waste. So they buy a potter's field where they can bury foreigners um, with, that, with the money that they are given. The scene just reveals the wrongness of everything, of all of this to me. Everyone knows this is a sham. This is unjust. This is, this is literal blood money. And yet we just are going to keep going with it because we are threatened by Jesus. The leaders, they need to bend and break the rules. They are so, they need to get people to lie. They need to bribe people. And they even acknowledge that they're doing it. They won't take the money back. They acknowledge that this is all wrong. We as humans can get so blind to what is good, what is right, what is just. We can become so convinced that we are, we are actually doing the right thing. And anything that gets in our way is wrong. And we can leave a trail of human misery in our wake trying to do what we want. My principle for the section is God's sovereign plan up sovereign plans uphold his perfect dis justice despite human injustice. We have seen so much human injustice and we will continue to talk about it in the next passage. Peter's denials, Judas's betrayal, basically every single thing the chief priests and the elders are doing. And yet God's plan cannot be thwarted by them. His son is going to the cross to be our savior our atoning sacrifice, just like the scriptures foretold. Just like we saw over and over again in Genesis, God can take what is meant for evil and he can turn it into good. We see a lot of evil in this section, but we know how the story ends. We celebrated it yesterday. Our final section for tonight is the last part, at least that we're talking about today, of Matthew 27, 11 through 31. Jesus tried before Pilate and sentenced to death. So Pontius Pilate is the Roman governor, the Roman prefect. He rules on behalf of the emperor. He's ruling over the area they call Palestine. So normally he would not be in Jerusalem. He would be in Caesarea, a place that gets talked about in uh, Acts. But like most people in Jerusalem, he was in town for Passover. So he just is kind of there to see this big religious ceremony and give his official Roman stamp of approval on the whole thing, and then be on his way. He likely wants to show up, do his perfunctory duties, and get it over with. And he gets way more than he bargained for when he shows up to work on Friday. So notice how the charge against Jesus has changed from what the high priests were so upset by. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Implying the priests are really playing up this political figure that he is he's trying to pronounce himself the king of the Jews. Pilate wouldn't have cared about an internal Jewish dispute like blasphemy or this, you know, the son of David, you know, is the Messiah a God figure? Doesn't care about that. But a political threat, that would have gotten his attention and made Jesus worthy of death in his eyes. So the high priest and the elders aren't focusing on the blasphemy, even though that's the charge that they claim that they leveled against him when it was just them. Now they're focused on what they can do to try to get Jesus executed by the Romans, so they kind of change it to focus on being like, he's the, he calls himself the king of the Jews. Again, anything resembling fairness or justice is just gone. It's completely out the window, and it's basically besides the point. Pilate does seem to understand that what's happening in front of him is wrong, and Jesus' refusal again to give answers or dignify anything that is happening only makes Pilate amazed and seemingly more confused and troubled. Pilate even gets a note from his wife 
who would have been the emperor's granddaughter, if you're curious, telling him not to have anything to do with an innocent man because she's been plagued by dreams about Jesus. Pilate has the authority and the ability to stop this charade, but he places fear of man above fear of doing the right thing or doing the right thing above fear of God. The chief priests and the elders, they've whipped up a crowd of people from Jerusalem. Um, they've whipped them up in a fury and they want the blood of Jesus. So he, Pilate, is also a foreign imperial ruler in a rebellious land. You know, the reason everyone's looking for the political messiah. A lot of people want revolution. That's the secret to nobody. And he has no interest in paying the political cost that would have taken him to free Jesus when his loudest and currently the present constituents are in front of him and they want this guy dead. Being a leader is an honor bestowed by God, but it comes with responsibility to bear his image and reign and rule on God's behalf. We are called to fear the Lord and follow his commands. And in this situation, it would have meant doing the unpopular thing, but upholding God's justice. Pilate kind of tries to politically wiggle his way out of the situation. Reading from the text, starting with verse 15. Now it's the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At the time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest they had handed Jesus over to him. Pilate's aware, hey, you're, I'm doing the dirty work of you guys right now. He tries to appeal to the crowd to save the people. Instead of doing the right thing, he's kind of trying to like have his cake and eat it too. He doesn't want to upset them, but he doesn't want to put an innocent man to death. The crowd is uninterested in playing his games or assuaging his fears of feelings of guilt. And they demand that Jesus Barabbas be freed instead of Jesus the Messiah, who they want to be crucified. Jesus Barabbas, ironically enough, he is the political revolutionary. He attempted to lead a rebellion against Rome with the zealots. Barabbas is the political messiah. He looks way more like the political messiah so many people wanted or were afraid of than Jesus ever did. It is completely fitting and no accident then that Jesus dies in his place on the cross. Barabbas is the true representative of where Israel is in this point of their story and how things have gotten so warped and Jesus gets to die in his place. Jesus is our savior the one who died for us. But this scene illustrates how he's also Israel's savior. He's meant to die in their place and turn them from the path that they were on. And while some Jews will receive the message of Jesus, many, including many in the leadership, will not, which is why the temple will fall within this generation. So Pilate sees that his tactic is getting nowhere. He tries to literally wash himself of the blood of the man he knows to be innocent. What's interesting is Romans didn't really wash their hands. So he's picked up on some Jewish customs. He's kind of like trying to show it back to them. You know, we talked a lot about hand washing in an earlier chapter. So I thought it was an interesting detail. Just like the chief priests and the elders did to Judas, he has no interest in taking responsibility for what is going on, even though he has the power and he's been placed in a role by God where he has the authority and ability to stop it. Pilate comes across as just weak and self-interested. He doesn't want to do what is right and deal with the consequences. He wants to do what is best for himself. The pilot is not innocent of Jesus' blood. You can't, you can't wash your hands of this because he hands him over to be crucified and ultimately pronounces the judgment against him. He is just as responsible. So it's particularly horrible that this mostly Jewish crowd at the behest of the chief priests and the elders want Jesus not just to die, but to be crucified. When Jewish people invoked capital punishment internally, we will see that in Acts with Stephen, they stoned people to death. Uh, the reason they did this is because they weren't supposed to crucify people. Crucifying someone was understood to mean that God has invoked a curse upon you. They get this from Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. If someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on a pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day. Because anyone who is un hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. You know, there's a lot we could talk about this here because it's like, why would you do, you know, why does God capital punishment? We'll leave it all aside. But this is what they're referencing of it was a curse. They wanted, they didn't just want Jesus to die. They want him to die in a way that is going to make him feel like God has cursed him. 
They want to do so in the most humiliating and painful way possible. And again, if they had any interest in carrying out just capital punishment and not just trying to humiliate Jesus, they just would have stoned him. The section ends with a brief but terrible description of the abuse and mocking that Jesus receives. He's flogged. The Romans had a particularly cruel way of flogging people. Just a preliminary to crucifixion, the victim will be whipped with leather straps that had bone or metal fragments attached to the ends. So they're almost flaying you alive. The flesh will be ripped from the back of the sufferer, and sometimes salt will be poured in the wounds to make it one more painful, but two to get you to stop bleeding so you could survive until your crucifixion. It's brutal. This is brutal stuff. The Roman soldiers seem to view this as a wonderful opportunity to mock their would-be political threat. They pretend to just dress Jesus up as a king, and they mock, bow to him. But they give him a crown of thorns, which is really painful, and they end up beating him in the head over and over again. Again, apparently it's simply not enough to kill Jesus. You need to torture him, both physically and mentally. The ability of us human beings to be so cruel to each other, it's terrible. It's mind-boggling. And this is one of the clearest examples of that. We have, here we have a man who's done nothing but teach the truth, heal the sick, and advance God's kingdom. And it ends with his story ends with him being tortured, mocked, and headed to the cross. I guess, thankfully, it's not the end of his story. That's what it looks like it's going to be the end of the story. My final principle for tonight is human evil cannot stop God's sovereign plans. This section, not just human injustice, but human evil. This section is particularly cruel to read from the casual indifference and just inhumanity of Pilate looking at this innocent man to the outright viciousness of the crowd the Roman soldiers, and the leaders of the Jewish people. All these people thought they were stopping Jesus. They thought they were putting him in his place, putting him back to where he belonged. But instead, their evil is what allows God's sovereign plan to go through. And Jesus was sent to the cross where he'd be the perfect substitute and sacrifice for all mankind. It can be difficult to see and observe all this evil and really trust that God is sovereign, even when we know the end of the story. God has given humans ability and authority to reign and rule on his behalf, and we frequently misuse and abuse that authority. We see that plainly here. But God's plan for this world is to save it, and he is still able to accomplish that goal, even though everyone thinks they're getting in the way and stopping it, because God cannot be thwarted or stopped. And he can take these moments of being in the, you know, the lowest parts of the valley and take us to the mountaintop. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son and his willingness to humbly submit himself to the cross, Lord, in all the pain and suffering that led to. We thank you that he was our perfect substitute who went to the cross and died on our behalf. Just pray that you would be with the discussions tonight. They would be um, fruitful and honoring to you. Here's something we pray. Amen.